Welcome back to the Brahmin Word, and we are continuing on with looking at biblical figures and ones that we have heard of before, that we've heard their um, their stories before, but sometimes um, if we've heard about something like that so many times that we lose track of some of the minor details that when you look at their life again, it makes you go, wow, I didn't really recognize that before. So we've looked at um, a couple so far with Samson and Gideon, but now we're going to go a little bit further into the, the future in the Old Testament, and that is with the prophet Jonah. So we're going to turn to the book of Jonah, uh, which has four chapters, and we are going to look at a guy that is a prophet of the Lord, but yet he has a lot of emotional flaws and he has a very big um problem with with grace and understanding grace and who grace is meant for so we're we're going to see that a little bit as we go through the life of Jonah but first we're going to just start with chapter 1 and uh and uh, and get to the really big point in life of Jonah, and that's him being swallowed by a fish. Uh, so we'll, we'll get to that in a second. So Jonah chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. So verse 2, we're just seeing right away that this place, Nineveh, is a great city. Now, does that mean, what What does that mean, a great city? Yes, it means physical, uh, like the geographical um, measurables of the city. It was a huge city. But I think it also means their reputation. It's known as a great city because it is brutal. It's this ruthless, just strong uh, city, strong physically, <laughs> uh, but the evil that they have done has, the Lord has tried to give them grace upon grace upon grace, and now it's just finally, <laughs> this is crazy what they're up to. Uh, they are just, they're just disobeying the Lord time and time and time and time and time again, and so he's going to give them one last seemingly one last chance, and then they will be overthrown. And they actually do. Uh, Nahum, the prophet Nahum, kind of goes into that a little bit, into the destruction of Nineveh. Um, but we'll, we'll get We'll get to that. Uh, that will be for a different time. <laughs> but first, we want to just focus on Jonah. So Jonah has been given a a purpose and a call. Uh, and he is the prophet of the Lord, according to verse 1. However, this is how he responds. Verse 3. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. So first off, obviously, it's it's funny to us to think that somebody can run away from the Lord on a boat. Obviously, that's not the case. But it it's interesting, based on the geography, what Jonah is doing here. So Jonah is not taking a boat that is going to sail um, past Nineveh. He is going to take a boat and go the opposite direction. So yes, he's running away from the presence of the Lord, but he's also running away from the mission of the Lord that um, he has given him. And so it's not just that he's trying to run away from the Lord, but he's also running away from his own duty and his own work as a prophet. And so that kind of gives us a little bit of a uh, of an introduction to him as as a person. Um, uh, now we'll get more into why he do, he did this in chapter four, um, but for here he just he he goes the opposite direction. Um, however, the Lord has a plan in mind. So verse four. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the 
ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his god, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lie in it for them. But Jonah had gone into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So, you have Jonah go on this ship with very experienced um, mariners. They are this is what they do. They they live on the sea. They know the sea. They nothing should cut should catch them off guard, and yet this storm does. It is so grand. It's so chaotic that the men who live on the sea and know the sea and work on the sea. Um, they are just completely afraid to the point where they are calling out to uh, their to their gods. And when we say God, we're not talking about Jehovah, we're not talking about Yahweh, and we're not ta- talking about the Lord. We're talking about pagan deities that aren't there. <laughs> and so these guys are crying out to these pagan deities. Nothing's happening. Nobody's responding. Uh, and yet the guy who has the actual communication with the actual Lord is asleep. (laughs) He's asleep down in the ship when this thing is just going nuts, Um, which should, as a reader of scripture, kind of make the light bulb go off in your head and go, wait, this is what Jesus did. Now, obviously, there's big contrast between Jonah and between Jesus, but you see some similarities. You have the mariners that should be used to this. You have the disciples, um, and some of them being fishermen, that should be used to choppy waves, but yet it's so great and so destructive and chaotic that they're just freaking out. And uh, the person that uh, is... The connection uh, to the Lord who is causing uh, the 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 storm, uh, they're asleep in the boat. Now, Jesus uh, is the one who is in charge of the storm and is also asleep. And he go, and he wakes up and changes uh, the sea to, from stormy to 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 calm. Whereas Jonah is not the one that obviously controls the waves, but he 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 knows the person uh, that is. And so the captain wakes him up in verse six. So the captain came and said to him, "What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish." Because ours don't. That's pretty much what he's saying. He's like, look, we've tried. We've tried to talk to our own gods. They're not listening because they're not there. Uh, They're not, they don't exist. And so, well, maybe this guy who's on this boat with us, maybe he has a deity that's different from ours. And maybe his God will respond to what's going on. Uh, Now, they don't know who he is. He does They don't know who Jonah is. They don't know who the Lord is but they're about to find out. So verse 7, And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So it's basically this this chance, this game, this game of chance, try and figure out what's going on. And the Lord uses that uh, to show that um, it is Jonah. The Jonah is the cause of this. So then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and of what people are you? Very, honestly, very, it makes sense why they ask those questions. Verse 9, and he said to them, I'm a Hebrew and I fear the Lord. Look how he describes the Lord here, by the way, in verse 9. The God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. I don't think that's a coincidence that Jonah describes the Lord as the one who not only controls the sea, but made it. He made, he created the sea. I don't think he does that an accident. I think he did that on purpose to say, look, I realize that everything that's going on is because of Yahweh, but it's because of of the fact that I'm running away from the Lord. And in verse 10, that's shown. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? And it's, it's so sad that 
pagans, um, those who don't follow the Lord, see the destructive way of Jonah's disobedience before Jonah does. Uh, for the men knew that he was fleeing, in verse 10, for the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. He even told them that, they're, that he's running away from the Lord, and yet the light bulb still has gone off for Jonah, and yet it does for these unbelievers. Uh, it, it's both sad, but it's also encouraging to see how the Lord can work within within folks that mess up and and he's about to do something incredible with these mariners for sure verse 11 then they said to him what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us for the sea grew more and more to it's getting worse for he said to them pick me up and hurl me into the sea then the sea will quiet down for you for i know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you so he's finally, John is finally admitting it. He's not admitting why he ran away. We're going to get to that later. But he's admitting that, yeah, this this is me. And so verse 13. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land. But they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. They're trying their hardest not to throw this guy overboard. Because they care about uh, the person. Uh, they care about human life. Verse 14, Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. And so, yes, they care about Jonah's human life, but they also they also don't want to get on the Lord's bad side. <laughs> they think if, okay, if this is how the Lord acts with some guy just not doing what he said, how, what is he going to do to us if we throw this guy overboard and he dies, knowing that he has a connection with this this God called Yahweh? How is Yahweh going to respond? <laughs> so there is some fear there, for sure. Um, but Jonah says, no, we got to go for it. We got to do it. So verse 15, so they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea stopped from its raging. Uh, verse 16, then the men, men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Verse 16, what a beautiful verse. I mean, you have this prophet of the Lord that has this great connection to God, and yet he seems to be so distant, not just from the fact that he's trying to run away from God, but he just seems so distant spiritually from the Lord. And yet these unbelievers that are so far from the Lord spiritually, yet when they are in the presence of the creator of the world, they fear the Lord exceedingly. Would that fear the Lord exceedingly? For them, yes, that does mean that there is some trembling in there, but this it's a reverence, like, oh my gosh, we we have just witnessed the Lord himself working, and they offered to sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. They now understand who the Lord actually is. Those gods that they have been praying to and worshiping to earlier in this passage, they mean nothing. <laughs> they mean nothing anymore, because now we know who the Lord is, and it, what what a beautiful verse that is. Verse 16 of chapter 1 of the book of Jonah. What a beautiful verse that is. However, the Lord hasn't forgotten about Jonah. Uh, Jonah deserves to be thrown over, but the Lord has not forgotten about him. Verse 17. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Um, the verb appointed there is really, really important. Uh, really important. And it's a past too. So the fact is that when Jonah was thrown overboard, the Lord knew uh, that that was going to happen. So he had already appointed uh, this fish to come about to rescue Jonah from the waves. Uh, because yes, the surface was calm, but part of me wonders if the under part of the sea below the waves and the surface of the sea was still moving and was still powerful. And so in my case, I, Jonah's pro Jonah could possibly be drowning at this point. Uh, and so because of that, the Lord isn't like, 
Oh my gosh, he just got thrown into the sea. Fish, come and get him. No, he's he's like, look, I know Jonah's about to get thrown into the sea, so this fish is already on its way to go and save and rescue Jonah. Um, I think that's what a beautiful picture that is. And then the the three days and three nights, um, again, there's not coincidence coincidence that Jonah was in the belly of the fish for that long uh, because eventually uh, Jesus relates back to the three days and three nights that uh, that Jonah was in the belly of the fish. He will connect that to his own burial uh, later in the Gospels. Uh, now, finally, I will talk about this. Uh, was it a whale? Maybe, <laughs> but in the original language, it's just a great fish. Again, it could have been a whale. It's really cool to depict it as a whale, uh, but it's just a great fish. So, the, but the thing is, we we <laughs> we spent so much time thinking about: is it a whale? Is it? What kind of fish is it that we forget about the fact that uh, it is a form of grace, it is a form of grace, uh, that there was even a fish like that there at that moment uh, to rescue, to rescue Jonah from the waves. So we will continue on with the life of Jonah on Thursday, and we will dive into chapter two, which is very much a poet. Uh, it's kind of like a po uh, poem of Jonah. It's uh, poetry, has a lot of poetry language in there. So we'll break that down on Thursday. However, I will see you for the Broadman Word tomorrow. Thanks.